This week I'm going to be starting a slightly different new and improved video format for the show. Let me know what you think of the changes. There are three good topics to discuss this week. The partial shutdown in the US, the pending deal vote in the UK, and the seemingly never-ending trade war with China. The trouble is that I'm not sure if China trumps May or May trumps China. I'll show myself out. In all seriousness, I think that all of these things are connected. How, you ask? Well, it's time for some Roasted Opinions. Let's start with the obvious stuff, the global markets. The Dow is slowly bouncing back off of a huge plunge in the fourth quarter, despite fairly strong holiday sales in many sectors. The bond market went from a pretty flat growth curve to a partial inversion, albeit a flat inversion. Global trade markets in Europe, not quite certain how to plan for March 29th, are still suppressed badly as UK companies attempt to plan for all possibilities, including a revocation of Article 50. In Asia, they've been experiencing a long year of beatings taken on their markets due to the trade war between China and the United States. This is certainly affecting U.S. stocks, but it's still not all bad news. And yes, the President of the United States is currently at war with Congress over the border wall. So much so that he refuses to pass any legislation to relieve the partial shutdown, which has nine government departments closed. Honestly, though, it's not all bad news. No, really. Let's take a look at things. Everything which increases uncertainty in the markets increases volatility. Investors are effectively gamblers. Long-term investments are generally safer than short-term investments, but short-term investments have a greater chance of profitability. In the investment game, this is called risk. The best investment brokers know how to manage risk so that people putting their retirement savings into their hands maximize their profits at the limits of risk with which those clients are comfortable. Volatility makes investors uncomfortable, which makes their brokers uncomfortable, which makes the markets uneasy. You get the picture. Trade wars definitely create uncertainty. Major changes to trade relations like Brexit also do this. This has ripple effects which we are seeing in the bond markets as uncertainty is affecting the price and causing those changes in the yield rates. The partial inversion shows up as a dip where the yield curve is plotted instead of a steady curve. But is it just a curiosity? Um, no. Just, no. Investors and economists are looking for things like yield curve inversions. It's a big part of their job to predict what will happen in the markets, especially when talking about recessions. Bond yield curve inversions typically accompany a recession as governments and major companies attempt to drum up investment capital to shore up their position and get the economy back on track. When the bond yields for mid-range treasury bonds dropped below the yield for the one-year bonds, it was definitely noticed. So were downward trends in exports from the U.S. to China and the price of commodities like crude oil and soybeans. Investment strategies change during a recession as fund managers transfer their positions from holding securities long-term to bouncing between investments to catch small movements or snatching up heavily discounted stocks that they predict have bottomed out. Naturally, the money market press began to talk about all these threats to continuing economic growth. A recession is bad for the economy, but it's good for spurring change. Bad economies strengthen opposition parties. Bad economies expand social programs and control over industries. You see, as we all see the increased inflation and decreased job security of a bad economy, the better angels of our natures come out. Most people actually help each other out even when they perhaps cannot afford it. Human nature may be more selfish during a booming economy, but I've found that the inverse is true during a bust. We give, sometimes until it hurts, to make certain that, for instance, kids have meals and holiday presents. Celebrities make major donations to publicly inspire others to give more. Programs are expanded or even created during a contracting economy. Yes, contracting economies and recessions are really good for the opposition party. And in the United States right now, the opposition party is the Democrats. 
They only hold one house, the House of Representatives, but they act as if they control Washington. If the border wall really was a problem, Nancy Pelosi would actually have funded it just so that she could use it to have a ridiculous white elephant project to point at and say, look, the current president is wasting taxpayer money by the billions. We need to replace him. So, China, Trump, May, how do they play into this? Let's take a look at what the markets were doing in 2017, shall we? The Dow Jones Industrial Average grew from 19,762.60 points to 24,719.22 points, an increase of just over 25% in market value in one year. The FTSE 100, a comparable index in the UK, grew from 7,142.83 points to 7,687.77 points, an increase of 7.6% of market value. The Shanghai SE Composite Index grew from 3103.64 to 3307.17, an increase of 6.5% of market value. Global trade increased too. The U.S. traded nearly $3.9 trillion in goods and services, up about a quarter of a trillion dollars. The U.K. total trade closed on 1.3 trillion pounds, up more than 150 billion pounds. China's total trade reached just under 27.8 trillion yuan, up 3.4 trillion yuan. Then, 2018 happened. President Trump put his foot down with President Xi regarding the massive trade imbalance and forced tech transfers between the U.S. and China. Prime Minister May began negotiations in earnest with Jean-Claude Juncker about the Brexit deal. The markets really don't like tit-for-tat tariffs and they don't like trade deal uncertainty. Trump and Xi traded massive tariffs, a more spirited response from China than had been raised by Canada and the EU in response to Trump's tariffs on their goods. Canada and Mexico eventually negotiated revisions to the North American Free Trade Agreement. The EU seems to have mumbled, unfair, and gotten back to their plan of punishing the UK for voting to leave. They offered May a deal which essentially left the UK in a vassal position, still bound by laws over which they had no more say, and transferring huge amounts of money to pay for that dubious privilege. When the UK Parliament revolted against the capitulatory terms of the exit deal, May went back to renegotiate and ran into a stone wall. And the markets in 2018 went from strong, steady growth to volatile swings and contractions. Remember that I said that investors are gamblers? Well, everywhere else but in America, the gamblers were pulling back and the markets showed this. In the U.S., however, the markets surged and dropped, then surged and dropped again. American investors were still taking chances, betting that China and perhaps the EU would be forced to back down as they were hoisted by their own petards. It all dovetails together, but all of these factors still don't explain everything until you add back in those economists and market journalists. When perhaps not all the news was bad, and perhaps even a strong stand against unfair trade deals could have brought China and the EU back to the table in a more conciliatory tone, those economists and market journalists kept ringing the alarm bells and warning of a recession. Because of the bond curve inversion, right? Well... It's not even really a partial inversion. It's a relatively rare curve called a positive butterfly, with a hump at the one-year bond rate. An inversion happens when yield rates for long-term bonds drop below those of short-term bonds, and that hasn't actually happened. The yield curve really isn't a portent of recession at this point. It's a sign of more volatility. But is global trade falling off? A little, but after a massive year in 2017. You also have to keep in mind that even as China decreased their imports from the U.S., their exports to the U.S. increased to a new record level. Even with the tariffs, Americans are buying more Chinese goods. China decreased its buys of commodities like soybeans and crude oil to put pressure on the U.S. agriculture and energy sectors. But it hasn't really worked as more crude production has created a huge supply buildup and lowered prices, spurring Americans to spend more on goods and services instead of at the gas pumps. The soybeans which China refused to buy from the U.S. were bought instead by Argentina, which sold practically their entire stock to China and bought American soy to replace it. The prices for beans aren't as high as they were, but in all honesty, the only place with a significant shortage of soybeans right now is China. 
President Xi recognizes this, which is why he is coming back to the table with President Trump to renegotiate. So long as Trump remembers to give Xi some wins so that he can take them back home, then both Trump and Xi will get a much more open, fair trade agreement, and U.S. exports to China will roar back to new record numbers. When the U.K. Parliament votes on the Brexit deal, we will see what happens, certainly. I think personally that the bad deal will fail entirely, and May's government will likely crumble because of it. Her three options that she offered to Parliament will become two, no deal or revoke Article 50. Personally, I'm betting on no deal. I think that the UK will crash out and the new Prime Minister will renew negotiations with the US and China independently of the EU. If so, then the UK will make up the difference in their economy, and then some perhaps even enjoying some explosive GDP growth of their own. I really wish that Theresa May could have seen this two years ago. The EU would be begging to make a good deal with the UK by now if May had negotiated good trade deals with the two largest economies in the world that took effect as soon as the UK left the EU. I think that eventually the EU will be brought back to the table, if it survives, to negotiate a much more even-handed trade deal with the UK. And don't believe all the market reporting hype. I believe that 2019 will boom just like 2017 did. And I believe that the US, the UK, and China will beat the global growth curves. Now that's just my opinion. Comment below to share yours. If you like this video, check out my playlists. Check out these channels I have subscribed for more great content. New episodes are coming, so subscribe and ring the bell.